after a few minutes, what does that person feel like happened? It feels like they rolled up right. Now, if they happen to be flying the airplane to get back into that 30 degree turn, what do they now crank in control wise? Now you're at a 60 degree bank. And what starts happening to stall speeds the steeper your bank goes? Harder. Okay. And a lot of times you fall out of that, how are you going to hit the ground? Hard. Like okay. that. See fit. I'm flying that airplane into the ground straight ahead. How many of you have ever taken a look at our runway out here? That press runway 2 1, long one. You notice how it bows in the middle? It does. The FAA says airports can actually deviate from the horizon. It's been a lot of for seven or eight days. Anyway, can deviate from horizontal as much as three degrees. What's a normal glide slope? I'm flying my airplane in on a normal approach. What's the glide angle I'm attempting to achieve? No, three degrees relative to the ground. And I've got a runway that slopes toward me. Human factors wise, we have what's called sight picture. That doesn't look right. I adjust my sight picture. What kind of a glide slope am I now flying? That runway is sloping toward me. Zero. Which means where am I going to impact? Short of the runway. And a lot of times that's exactly what happens. Now you get the opposite effect. Runway looks like that. How do I adjust my airplane's angle to make it look right? I climb. Now I'm flying a 6 degree glide slope. I'm a Navy pilot. I'm going to land on a carrier. <laughs> and where do I test down on my aircraft? In the middle of the runway. In the middle of the runway. Yeah. And if it's a short runway, where do I end up? Uh, Off the other end. end. Uh, a lot more in the water if you're yeah. going to your places like that. All of that is still controlled flat into terrain. Now why is more visual illusion? Loss of control. Usually it's going to uh, terminate the spiral impact. Stop. Turn it off. Okay, sorry. Anyway, steep nose down attitude, high degree uh, angle bank. Doesn't have to be a spin. You may be just spiraling in. Back in 1997, or 99, we had a real good example of that. 300 hour private pilot, not instrument rated, going to a wedding, got offshore. You get the chance to fly offshore, one of the things that happens a lot, anybody in here from California, been to California? Oh, I did too. If you look out on the horizon and there's much moisture in the air, Particularly right at sunset, what do you lose? You lose the distinction between the sky and the water. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Oh, I thought you nodded, yes. Anybody? Kind of. I've actually seen that where it's got a lot of water and you just like whoa. You can't tell which is which. And if you don't get on instruments right away, where do you end up with that airplane? Doing what JFK Jr. did. That's who that was. So that's the type of thing. This is all evidence. This is all the beginnings of figuring out what the airplane is. Okay. One of the ways we try to preserve evidence, and you're probably going to need to do this next week, wreckage diagrams. Now that's in your packet. The two that most of us use most of the time are what are referred to as linear diagrams or grid diagrams. Linear diagrams work better for small accident sites. Grid diagrams, big spread out crash sites. I usually have a relatively intact aircraft. The problem with these small sites is I have to use conventional measurement techniques. I can't use my GPS anymore because I don't have the position accuracy. If my entire accident scene is less than 100 feet long, how accurate are most GPSs? It depends on how many satellites you're looking at at one time, but some of the best ones, the more expensive ones, you can get it down to four or five feet. Is that enough for a 100 foot site? No. What's conventional measurement techniques? Tape measures. 
measuring wheels, some of the other waves. And what we're producing is a map of where everything is. Got a couple of examples, and I gotta kill the overhead for a second. That's why. What are you looking at there? It's a crashed airplane. Okay, good. What kind of airplane? Cessna, what kind of Cessna? It's a 150. It's 150. Two people on board. How would you go about diagramming that? It's a small site. Well, you do the four corners first. Do the four corners, okay? You've yeah. got two of them inside. Yeah. The other two are out here. It's really close. And then you it's, they're all, the airplane's intact. Yeah. Relative. Two fails. <coughs> Propulsion is lying to you because that propeller doesn't look like it had any power on it, but in reality, there's a reason. Because it's turned off. Yeah. And who did that? Pilot. Probably pilot. pilot. Look at the road behind them. Now, even from this picture, can you tell the condition of the road? It's wet. You see all the clouds? Next slide. There's the same airplane looking the other direction. What do I see right here? There's another road that's wet. And now what do I see? Kind of hard to make them out. Clouds. Car lines. Some of you have probably passed this spot maybe many times. How many of you have been on I-40 between Ash Fork and Williams? That's where this is. Where's that airplane sitting? In the median between the two, two halves of I-40. Now, this is a non-instrument rated pilot who lives in Kingman and wants to go to Flagstaff. He's non-instrument rated, but he can do IFR. What does IFR mean to him? I follow road. He knows I-40 will take him to Flagstaff. When he intersects with I-17, you turn right, fly for two minutes, turn left, and what are you looking at? Flagstaff Airport. <laughs> Problem is, the weather conditions this particular day are real low ceilings. And it, you really can't make it out in this picture, but any power line has a dip in it. And the problem is, the cloud base has been lowering. The closer you get to terrain, the separation between the cloud base and the ground gets narrower and narrower. And this guy's trying to stay out of the clouds, but now he's having to bump in and out of the clouds. We call that scud running. The problem is, what does he manage to snag? Power line. Power, power line. Which catches his wing. By the way, how do we know he snagged the power line? Yeah. It's stuck in his wing. <laughs> and he pulled the other end of it off one of the pylons. And it swung him around and down, which is how he ended up with a steep angle. Now think about how you diagram that one. It's a relatively easy one. This was our airport a few years ago. That is a Piper Aerostar. It's a neat little twin engine airplane. Uh, Bob Hoover. Anybody know who Bob Hoover is? No. Air show pilot. Yeah. Chuck Yeager's wingman in World War II. Oh, okay. You've got to teach him history. Oh, I don't teach him anything, sir. <laughs> this is the number seven Aerostar offline. Okay. This aerial picture, see the damage right here on the ground? Okay. And the airplane's turned almost a 90 degree angle to its original direction of travel. Now, do you think I can diagram from the top real easy? Based on that, I just got to get on the ground to do the measurements. Next slide. That's the airplane on the ground. A couple of things to look at. Look at the end number. DE. No, not what it is. How it's applied. It's been spray painted on. As a matter of fact, what caused the airplane to crash or go down is this right engine quit running. Now, normally a twin engine airplane should be capable of flying single engine. This guy wasn't. This airplane hadn't been maintained very well. And actually, when we got out there, Pilot was nowhere to be found. And everything inside that airplane had been stripped out. All of the cosmetic furnishings, the other sets of seats. He actually had a pair of vice grips on the mixture control from the right engine. Tells you something about how this airplane has been maintained. He also had a bunch of blue tarps piled in the back of the airplane. So we're probably beginning to get a picture of what might have happened here. And yes, indeed, we did call the EA to come out. They brought the dogs. Matt, they didn't get any hits. 
because what phase of his mission is he on? He's outbound. He's going down to get whatever he was going to get. Never got there. Is this still an accident? Yes. NTSB will investigate this as an accident. Indeed, they did. It took them three days to get there. The parts of the airplane were missing. That's another story. Anyway, how would I go about diagramming this? Is it a little bit more complex? Yeah. Excellent. Grid surveys. Big areas. Airplane breaks apart in flight. And pieces fall to the surface. A lot of times we actually have to do what are called line searches. Any of you folks ever done a line search? You walk down a line, 10 feet apart, and you look for stuff. Oh yeah. oh yeah. There you go, that's a line search. If you're out on a flight line, by the way, we call it a flight walk, but that's a different thing. Line search, I'm looking for parts of the airplane. How big I make my grids depends on the size of the area. Typically, 25 by 25 feet. I've seen them as big as 100 feet by 100 feet. Depends on the size. But this is a circumstance where I can use GPS mapping technology. I just input waypoints if I've got a mapping GPS system. And then I just run it out of the computer. And I can generate my grid survey. This also works real well for aerial surveying and photo mapping. Term photogrammetry comes in. That's a specialized technique of photography. Next slide. This is an older accident, but it's one of the first ones that we use this type of technique. Some of you may even have seen some of the movies that were made after this thing. This is Eastern Flight 401, down in the Everglades in December of 1972. This is an L-1011, back when L-1011s were brand new. And all of the crew members got very distracted. They're approaching Miami International. And they put the gear down. They don't get a nose gear line. Two possibilities. Your nose gear's bad. Light bulb's bad. They don't know which is which. So, captain decides to take them out over the Everglades. They put the airplane on autopilot. And they sit up there trying to figure out whether or not it's a gear problem or a light problem. And they stay out there a while. And... At one point, the captain is trying to get that light bulb out of its socket. We know this from the cockpit voice recorder. Okay. And we hear him say, let me get a better angle on that. And the next thing we hear is some rustling, and then the autopilot disconnect horn goes off. Yet the crew doesn't respond to it. Now when you turn the autopilot on, off, off rather, if the airplane was trimmed up properly, what's going to happen? You're just going to very slowly start to descend. Now this is pitch black night, it's 11 o'clock at night. And they're just very, very slowly spiraling out of the sky, all of them still working on the bad light bulb or bad gear. And, and the Everglades have no lights, guys. They're there, just as there's dark as anything. There. No external reference. And it, at a four degree bank angle, and 50 feet a minute descent rate, that's not enough to set off your vestibular system. So, nobody's paying attention to what? They're all working the problem. One of them should have been doing what? Fly the airplane. Find the airplane. Which means what should they have been watching? The sky. Things like altimeters and airspeed. And had any of them been doing that, what would they have noticed? Airspeed's winding down. Air traffic control even has a chance to stop this thing because it drops below radar coverage at 800 feet. If he'd used proper procedure, he would have said Eastern 401, say altitude, which probably would have made somebody do what? Say the altimeter. Say some colorful metaphors, climb back up to where they were, and dirty underwear is the worst thing you're going to deal with. <laughs> He doesn't use standard phraseology. He says Eastern 401 has it going out there. Now what do you think the flight crew thinks he's saying? Is the problem fixed? He means, you just dropped off my radar screen. They don't communicate. They continue on down. 
Seven seconds before impact, the co-pilot almost certainly looks at an altimeter because he says, hey, we're at 2,000, right? Seven seconds later, they hit the swamp. And that's the range. That debris field is about three quarters of a mile long. This is the largest piece of, next slide please, structure. There's bodies in that picture. Because they're down in the Everglades, anywhere from two to six feet of water. <coughs> you do have 79 survivors. Primarily because they came down in the water. Which did cushion the impact, and much more importantly, suppressed what? Fire! They were going to fire you without any survivors. 79 people actually didn't survive this thing. <coughs> Can you imagine having to diagram this thing? Because the first thing you got to do is even find stuff that's underwater or bury the mud. Next slide. Here's one of the drier areas. That's actually a wing spoiler. That is the biggest piece of that center fuselage that remained intact. Imagine having to diagram this thing. This is a grid survey. Next slide. This is a different circumstance. This is a unique, semi-unique type of accident. This is looking straight down at the impact crater from a DC-9. We can identify some of the parts. This is the aft pressure bulkhead of the fuselage. Outboard section of one of the wings, chunk of fuselage skin which is painted a forest green color, and you can see EEN. There's some debris back out of that crater. Now this one, the airplane impacted on its nose, dug a crater 14 feet deep, and that 98 foot long DC-9 Series 30 is now about 12 feet long. All of it, with the exception of the rebound in the crater. This is a contract military flight 